Good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Joe Horowitz. I am from Stetson Cyber Group. I am the Director of Compliance and Audit. Um, I'm here today to talk a little bit about what's going on in the world, uh, some, some breaches that have happened this year, uh, some regulations that we need to know about, and some things that we can do to protect ourselves and our clients. Um, as we go do our audits and we do our anything with uh, with them for consulting or anything of that nature. Um, I'm going to pull my slides. I'm going to share my slides. Hold on a second. Again, uh, let me do this so that I can show a slideshow and from the beginning. Okay. So we're going to talk about the audit risks. Uh, actually, they're going to be cybersecurity risks that really lead into audit and compliance. Uh, the greatest areas, some exposure, some and risk mitigation strategies, things, easy controls that I think we can always push on our clients or talk about in our own companies that really will uh, mitigate these risks. We, a little bit about us, uh, we really do provide security and privacy services for all different kinds of organizations. Um, we're a service level organization. We're not product driven. So what that means is we're not going to try to sell anybody on a product that they may not need to pay for or implement because a lot of places, what we've seen is already throwing a lot of money at technology. But now the problem is that either A, they're not configuring the technology correctly or to, the, uh, to maximize their protections, and they're not putting in all these other procedures and, and practices in place to really protect against uh, any kind of breaches or any kind of hacks or anything going on. Um, we do things like policy creation, the risk assessments, the penetration testing, uh, and really do conduct, we conduct these security awareness training, which is also be very important uh, in any organization. Um, a little bit about myself, I think it's important to know that I started my career in financial and operational audits. Uh, so I am not just an IT head. I do not do coding. I'm not one of those cyber people. Uh, every time I go anywhere, they, people are like, oh my God, you're one of those people sit behind a computer and just code and, and do all those things. That's not me. I think it's important to know that cybersecurity is not scary. It's not one of those things where you have to know everything about IT to implement that you have to know everything about IT to get your message across. But what you really need to do is understand that it's an organization-wide risk that everybody needs to be aware of and not just lay it on your IT department to protect you. Because we're, what we're seeing is that approximately uh, a very high percentage of breaches are happening from human error and from vendors. So uh, my background is I'm a CISA, CIA, um, and I'm, those are all the organizations I'm part of. Uh, and again, my background is in finance and accounting. So for someone to be in cybersecurity, finance and accounting, that's why I'm saying it's not a scary thing. When I go talk to a lot of organizations like yours, they, I, at the end of the end of the sessions, there's great questions, which I want, I encourage a lot of questions in the chat. I will answer anything you have on this. Uh, there are no stupid questions when it comes to cybersecurity. I'd rather you ask the questions to have the protection and detection of uh, procedures and methods in place to help yourselves. So I think it's important to know the definitions when we talk about cybersecurity. Anytime I go into any place and I do my trainings, I ask them, what's the definition of cybersecurity? And then when I show them, I ask them, what's not there in the definition that we sh that everybody thinks is part of the de definition? And everybody, I usually get a blank stare. And when I give the definition of cybersecurity, there's nothing that says it's directly related to your IT department. You know, it's really just protecting against unauthorized use or access of your, of your data. Um, and I always like to also say that if you don't want to use the term cybersecurity alone, because that's really just your program of how you're protecting things, then you look into also information security and data protection is really part of your program. So you're securing your information and you're protecting your data. And the cybersecurity is really just the overarching program and the definition of what you're doing to protect that information and data. So if everybody looks at this slide and they take this slide away, this really makes it a lot easier to understand what cybersecurity is out there in the world and what we're trying to accomplish. Um, 
I like to do this now because it's really important to know all the breaches that are happening in the world uh, and how they are affecting all of us. Um, you know, it, I think with the, the, the climate of the world that's going on today, the amount of attempts for breaches and hacks has increased exponentially. Um, I'm going to go through the top 10 of 2023 and we'll kind of fly through this a little bit and we'll talk about it just a little bit. But I want you to see that there's been already over 2,000 reported compromises for the year. And that could be across any industry. Um, what we like to do is we work a lot with education and those fields. And education has become one of the top three fields that have been, been attempted for hacks in the past year. But these are ones that I'm putting out here. Well, I'm going to tell you about them because either they direct, they'll direct they directly affect everybody on this call, your clients, or just per, you know, just personally. Um, the first one, Okta, which was just recently, and that has to do with multi-factor authentication. Now, I know everybody now is going to be like, what, you know, what do we do? We, everybody talks about putting in multi-factor authentication. And if Okta is hacked and, every, and Okta is the back end of the multi-factor authentication, what do we do? So the reason why I talk about that is because we have to realize that multi-factor authentication is not the end all be all control that we need to put in place to protect our information and data and to protect access to our systems. It's one piece, it's one level. While it's a really important level, we have to think of the fact that we must put multiple controls and multiple a defense in depth layer to protect our systems and our applications and our data. Uh, the next one that really could affect a lot of people is the 23andMe data breach that happened uh, just in October. Um, this was a targeted breach. You know, there's no going around this one. This one was very targeted. Uh, this one was really targeted towards certain groups of people. Um, there were two different ethnic groups that were targeted for this, and their information was hacked and breached. So if anybody here has ever done a DNA test, or any type of um, anything with 23andMe, I would say very much check out their website, check out their legal um, legalese, whatever they have going on, uh, any notifications about a breach and see if you've been affected in that hack. Uh, for anybody here also who entertains clients or goes to these golf outings, Top, top Golf, Gal Callaway Golf, they got hit earlier this year as well. Over 1 million customers for Callaway were hit. Um, Again, you know, this is names, shipping addresses, email addresses, a lot of information that they can get on any of their customers that can really uh, help them to social engineer, whether it be through a business or through your personal uh, personal accounts. Uh, Saber Corporation. A lot of people don't know who Saber Corporation is, but they are the back end travel reservations for a lot of airlines across the country. So if anybody here or any of your clients are traveling right, and they do travel for business all the time or just a regular personal traveler, your information may have been stolen from one of the, uh, the Sabre breach. Uh, I also like to talk about these US government breaches because the US government ones um, are just, a, 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 they're just as dangerous, if not more. I mean, we're talking about on this one alone with uh, from a contractor, a third party contractor, got a data breach, which included eight to 11 million citizens in the US. But what we really wanna talk about on this one is the fact that the move it file transfer a vulnerability was part of this. For anybody who has not heard about this move it file transfer vulnerability, I'm gonna talk about this for a moment. Um, move it file transfer is basically just that. People are using move it uh, just to move tra uh, move files from one company to another or within the company. They had a major breach last year. I can't tell you how many companies use move it. Uh, large corporations, government agencies, everybody across the board, a lot of places, including New York City public schools have been hit. Um, many, there's a lot more and other presentations I've done, I've gone through a whole list of move it breaches. This is a big one and it's still happening today. Uh, I think there's been some, since October 1st, there's been a few other companies that have been affected by this movement breach. So if anybody has a client or uh, know anybody who uses use it, move it file transfer, they should really look and make sure that they're, they have, if they have it, 
to, to see if any of these files have been stolen, if they've been breached or anything of that nature. This is a big one and it's gonna continue to happen because it's a real widespread um, usage of an application. Some other ones we need to talk about, um, you know, the top one, we're talking about pilots now. Thousands of pilots had their information stolen from American Airlines and Southwest, Southwest Airlines. The reason why this one is up there as well, even though it's in, only just in the thousands, we're talking about pilots. They could have been military background. There's a lot of pilots out there who were in the Air Force, were in the Navy, were in other military branches, and now they're having their, their information stolen. This becomes a national security issue. Um, we'll talk about later on in my, in my presentation about a couple of regulations that are coming down the pipe regarding to that the federal government has started to put in place that really is looking to prevent things like this. Uh, the next one for anybody on this call that has T-Mobile, they've had four data breaches since 2000, uh, 2021, four of them. The last one, in, well, not the last one, the one in January exposed 37 million people. That's the biggest breach this year, 37 million. Um, you know, one of the things about T-Mobile, and I have T-Mobile and their practices have really, even though they try to be customer friendly, their security has gone really by the wayside. From what I've been seeing, they've been cutting back on their customer service um, for data breaches. And now what they ask you to do is in order to get any kind of discounts for their services, you must directly link your bank account to T-Mobile. That is dangerous. So for anybody who has T-Mobile or knows anybody who's using T-Mobile, as much as you want to get those discounts, it's really dangerous to have them because they have very little security measures in place. So that's something we should all be aware of. Um, healthcare companies, APRIA, 1.9 million customers had their personal data stolen. Um, another U.S. government breach of 237,000 U.S. government employees uh, for the Department of Transportation. You know, we take that number and we can't just put it in a vacuum because that 237,000 people in the U.S. government really could pertain to a lot more people. We have to really think about these as the widespread reach of where these breaches can go. The last one I talk about here on the top 10 is also the House of Representatives because um, their families and anybody based on this healthcare provider, 170,000 people, again, another big government one. Uh, so it's, an, it's these are ones that really don't get publicized, but they're out there. And that's the scary thing. We don't know about these things. And then all of a sudden we're getting letters in the mail hey, you've been part of a breach, we're going to give you some credit monitoring. Well, I got to say credit monitoring is really, after the fact, is not the way to go. Uh, as much as it's nice to go forward, uh, these things should never happen because we know from our industry, there's just not enough protective or detective controls in place to prevent these things. Some other mentions for anybody who's, because uh, I know we deal a lot with the nonprofits and a lot of these companies, Sony, Save the Children, which is an international company that really deals with the welfare of children. The reason I put that in there too is because I want you to realize that hackers have zero ethics when it comes to stealing information and data. Uh, and I'd say that when I go to my school districts as well, they don't care if it's children's data. They will get that data and they will open up lines of credit. They will buy homes. They will do whatever they can. They really do not care. And a lot of them are coming from nation states these days. For those of us from the older generation that used to see in the movies like hackers, these kids in the basement, you know, hacking away, it's those days are gone. It's really, uh, it's really uh, nation states like North Korea, Iran, Russia, all those, all those countries that are really on the FBI list as ter listed as terrorist states that are doing this, they have full teams that are out there every single day trying to hack information from any industry, any company they can get on a regular basis. So I know that, and we'll talk about this a little later too, I, we have a lot of small clients and they think it's a, it's really, it's a nuisance that, hey, I have to write a policy, I have to put controls in place. But I don't think they realize that the reputational risk that's involved in this for their small company uh, we've seen a lot of small companies because of this happening just go out of business because they can't handle the fact that 
uh, they, they've lost all their data and nobody wants to work with them anymore. So these are kind of things that we need to bring to our clients. Uh, for anybody who has kids, Roblox, Poker Stars, well, that's not for kids, but uh, Pizza Hut, KFC, if anybody uses a Chick-fil-A app, Twitter, uh, now X, these are all different ones that have been hacked. The MSI one, for those of you who don't know MSI, uh, the, the acronym, that's for the their laptop or computer company. Apparently, they're, they have a ransomware on MSI, or I think it's this month, if they don't pay the ransom, they've been threatened to put some malicious BIOS firmware on anybody who owns an MSI computer. So that's something that I'm still trying to follow up on to see where that goes. So these things are happening. There's no ethics in, in these on these hackers. So the things that we need to be aware of at work and at home, uh, the phishing scams. You know, we love having the phishing test be done in any workplace <clears throat> environment, excuse me. Uh, the reason for that is not to single out anybody to embarrass them, but to really make people understand that this is one of the biggest reasons that companies get breached. Uh, I did throw out that there was a huge, big number, somewhere between 80 and 90% of all breaches and hacks happen because of either phishing attempts, business email compromises, which are more targeted email attempts, or vendors. And we always tell companies, if you do the phishing attempts, the phishing uh, tests, make them as difficult as possible. You make them easy and people get them and they're like, oh yeah, we get this. But I'll tell you what, they've gotten so complex with these phishing attempts, the hackers, that you, a lot of people just don't realize what they are. Um, you know, we have to learn how to hover over the, the email address that's coming in. We need to learn what seems like a, a, a bad phish, uh a bad attempt to try to get into our networks. These links, why should I have to click on a link? Why should I get uh, a business email compromise or someone saying that they're my boss that, hey, click on this link, we need to make this transfer. We need to step back for a minute in the middle. I know we're all very busy professionals, but we really need to be aware of these things. And it's unfortunate, but we do. Uh, the vishing attempts are the phone calls that come in, they leave the voice messages. They could be a bank. They could be or your credit card company saying, hey, you have fraudulent activity, or they can get you on the call. Don't give out the information. We see too many instances where they give out the information to realize it, much later on, it's not their bank. It's not their credit card company. Always hang up that call, pull the number on the back of the card and see if there really was an attempt on your account or something like that. Or look online and look online as well to see if there were any one penny or $1 charges on there. Uh, smishing are those text messages you get with also the links that say, hey, you want a gift card, click here. Or if there's a UPS package coming. Be very aware, don't click on those links, send those right to junk mail. And um, the new phone scam, they call and the right the first thing you say is hello. And then you're like, yes, you're no answers. And then with artificial intelligence, they're recording your voice. They're making different sentences and then they're using your voice and these sentences and AI to uh, do malicious things like opening up credit lines and, and all kinds of the fraudulent things on your accounts. So just things to be aware of uh, us as human beings, because I know we get busy, but step back for a second and just really realize that these things are happening. If you see a phone number that you don't recognize, let it go to voicemail. If you have to call them back, call them back. Uh, I think some cybersecurity regulations we need to talk about that are coming down the pipeline or are out there already. Um, hold on a second, I just want to minimize this a little bit. Okay. So um, the SEC in July has put out a regulation that where all public companies must disclose anything regarding any information regarding their cybersecurity risk management, their strategy and governance. So that has to go in 8Ks. For, uh, and it has to be disclosed to their shareholder and then share and disclosed to the public. Um, they need to know now as public companies that what you're doing to protect information. Um, on uh, one thing that's not up here, that I also, also want to mention because it, a lot of us are CPAs and I should, I should put it in there. The IRS uh, is, is requiring every tax professional to have a written information security policy. Um, I have the regulation. I'll, I'll have to get that for everybody. I have it written down. I have it on another slide somewhere, but um, another in presentation. But even if you're a one-person CPA firm, 
you must give to the IRS a written information security policy of any security plan that you have in place to protect your client's data. Okay, please understand that no matter the size of your company, if you're doing any kind of tax work or CPA work, you must have this written information security plan. Uh, a couple of other ones, the FTC, make sure that financial institutions put, uh, are putting in uh, data protection in place to protect financial information. The Graham Leach Bliley Act of 99 requires financial institutions uh, to make sure that there is some kind of protection in place for their, their customers. I think, you know, people, because I, I it, it's crazy because I'm in this field and nobody talks about these regulations enough because the enforcement is just not there. The enforcement is very lax. There's not enough people enforcing this from a governmental perspective, but they're out there. Uh, I can tell you when we get to this, the next slide, and I'll, we'll talk about HIPAA quickly. HIPAA is also making sure that we protect any personal health information. So that's also data that needs to be protected. So if you have any medical clients, whether it be just a medical office, they must have something in place to protect information. And HIPAA has a full privacy act of all the things that need to be put in place for that medical office. So please make sure that they're, they know about this and they're following these things. For anybody here, because we're this is in New York State, there's a couple of, these are the only regulations that are in place right now in New York State. There's one for educational institutions. So any educational institution, whether it be nonprofit, profit, educational, uh, private schools, whatever the case might be, if they get any kind of funding from the New York State Department of Education, they must meet the requirements of New York State Education Law 2D, Part 121, which requires them to have cybersecurity plan in place. So if anybody here works with anybody that gets any kind of funding from the New York State Department of Education, please realize that they must have a whole plan in place and read this regulation. Uh, there's also the SHIELD Act, which also requires there to be a data security program in place for a lot of businesses, which is generally ignored. Everybody kind of glosses over that, but it's out there. Uh, again, the enforcement is not there. The other one that is actually getting starting to get more enforced is the one from the Department of Financial Services. We've seen a lot of companies now come to us and say, hey, we have been asked by our uh, insurance company or this company uh, or who we're working with to make sure that we're uh, we are in compliance with NYCR 500. That's put down by the Department of Financial Services, and there's a list of about 14 or 15 parts to this that you have to meet in order to be to have uh, to be compliant with their program. And they are actually auditing people for this, uh, auditing companies for this. It's any company that is falls under a banking law, insurance law, or financial services law. So the smallest insurance company falls under this. There are exemptions to this where certain parts of it may not have to be followed, but a lot of parts do have to be followed, such as there has to be a policy in place. There has to be something that states that there is a breach that they notify the state. So their MFA has to be implemented. So it's really important for us to know this as we are working with our clients that this is a regulation that they have to have in place. All right, some things that we can do and our clients can do to protect their information data and mitigate these risks. This is the important stuff that we really need to focus on, that we really need to understand why this stuff is important. And again, as someone who is not just an IT head, as someone who came from the business background, my background has not always been in cybersecurity. I've worked for corporations, I've worked for government, I've worked for healthcare, I've worked for technology companies, I've worked for commu cable and communications, Optimum here on Long Island, doing these things. It's important across any industry because of the amount of hacks that are happening today. All right, some of the things, first of all, we talk about, this is what I was talking about here, the written information security plan. So I do have it in here, great. Publication 5708 from, uh, from the IRS states that every tax and accounting practice must have a written, security, a written information security plan. No ifs, ands, or buts. And everybody that we've been working with has been getting letters from either the IRS or from their insurance company saying, where is your plan? Asking them for their plan. So please make sure that each of you are getting your 
written information security plan in place. If you go on the IRS website under the publication, they also have a template that you can use to fill out your plan. So it makes it very easy. It gives you different sections. You just fill it out. Um, also, the Graham Leach Bliley Act, again, uh, all tax pros must have that rent security plan. So it's coming from two different places, the IRS and the um, Graham Leach Bliley Act. Uh, and under the GLBA, tax and accounting prof professionals are all considered under this as financial institutions, no matter the size. Again, one person tax, tax offices must have a written information security plan. We've written for one person uh, tax, tax preparers already uh, multiple of these policies. Um, other things that we can do and that really need to be done every year, risk assessments. Uh, we push for the bigger companies to do them quarterly, but annual cybersecurity risk assessments to really identify where your risks are as a company, no matter what size you are, is really important. How do you know what to protect otherwise? If you have a lot of great technology things in place, but you realize that, hey, my employees are my biggest risk, how do you know that you don't have to put something in place like training or anything of that nature? Risk assessments are really important. Also fraud risk assessments. Uh, we really talk about doing fraud risk assessments as well, along with the cybersecurity risk assessments, because we find that, and in my career, I found that uh, fraud, the fraud definitions are very close to what the cybersecurity and the data protection information security uh, uh, definitions are. If you don't have those operational controls in place as well, there's a lot of openings for those people to to the outside world for fraud to happen and for cyber hacks to happen. So annual fraud risk assessments are just as important to perform as those cybersecurity risk assessments. Uh, we've done them for clients. It's funny because the first time you do those fraud risk assessments, you tell them about it, like, eh, you know, what are we doing this for? Their eyes are opened up so amazingly on how their processes are not buttoned down in places where they're not focusing on because that they may have not thought of as as important in the cybersecurity um, program. So really think about doing fraud risk assessments and incorporate your security control testing into all your audits. It's not hard to do a test on access. It's not hard to do a test to make sure that all uh, changes to the systems are being done in the in, in the ticketing system, or they're doing done with the, with the proper authorizations. They're done with testing before they're put into place. There are some really easy controls out there that we as auditors can add to our, our programs to really help the program. Uh, whenever I go into companies as a consultant, I ask them like, what are your internal auditors doing as far as any kind of audits and that include cybersecurity? That, because cybersecurity is one of the top three risks. Why are they not covering it? If no one else is covering it, except for us, maybe the one time that we're coming in, what good is the program going to be? It needs to be looked at. And in us as professionals, we can do that from those, in, those perspectives that really, that really are helpful in those areas. <clears throat> backups. Um, backups are super important. We need to make sure that every place creates these backup schedules that your data is saved at least daily. What happens? You get breached. People ask, all right, how do we how do we get our information back up and running? Um, I don't know. It was on the server in-house. The server was hacked as well. What do you do? I mean, we do recommend using backup uh, off-site locations for cloud servers. The reason we say that is because if you do get hacked on site, like I said, how, how else are you going to pull up this data? And it's really important, though, that even if you have your data in-house, or if you have your data in the cloud, you have to test those backups. You have to make sure that you can spin them up at least on a quarterly basis so that if something happens, it's working. Uh, we see a lot of instances where we've asked companies like, okay, you have your data in-house. Can you do tests to make sure that you can run up, your, pull up your data if you need it? We've seen it where they've never done the test before and then they can't pull up the data. So what happens? They've lost their data. We, even if you have an offsite, if you use like a, uh, a Sophos or anything of that nature or data, uh, any kind of backup tool, make sure that you are asking your IT administrator 
to run these quarterly tests to make sure that your data can be spun up in case something happens. To Another thing that we see, so, and so, yes, I'm sorry. Hi, can I interrupt you for one minute about the backup? So one of the, yeah. the pushbacks that we're getting when we do our questionnaires for our clients about mm -hmm. they do cloud backup, so therefore they don't need to test anything. They're solely in the cloud. Or they're using, you know, uh, applications that are, um, you know, on, online, you know, and mm -hmm. stuff like that. What advice yeah. would you give for that? So uh, like your own internal business, they are, are, they are also... Um, susceptible to any kind of breakdowns in their controls and their IT systems. You need to make sure that on their end, because they have service level agreements with you, that they're able to provide you with your data when you need it. That is their, that, that's what they have to do. If they, you have to let your companies know that you're auditing or that you're working with that. If you, like I said, if you can't pull up your data from your backup uh, from your data or whatever, uh, because we've seen that where we've had to go back to data and say, you have to fix this because you're not, there was a, there was a glitch in their systems. You have to account for that. So you really, it, it's an, it goes back to the relying on third party vendors to have all the security controls in place that you think that they have when they really don't. Uh, so you want it, you really want to tell your clients that, as much as the cloud, the data is in the cloud, all that means it's on a server somewhere else. And you still have to make sure that if you have a problem that you can get that data whenever you need it. Exactly. Yeah, because you don't want you don't want to lose weeks and weeks or months of data without knowing that it's not happening. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so we we have for all of our clients uh, that we make sure that every quarter that they're spinning up the data in some kind of test, whether it be targeted for a particular group in their in their organization or, you know, at different times just to make sure that, hey, you know, this critical data, let's see if we could spin that up today, you know, this time. So it doesn't have to be across the whole well, the whole organization or you could just do a server back, you know, a server pull up. Really, they can do it however they want. And it, I'll tell you what. There's nothing that your client has to do additionally other than putting in a ticket with their third-party vendor saying, please provide evidence that you've done the spin-up of my data and it's been spun up successfully. So there's really nothing additional that anyone has to do except get that report from your backup uh, vendor saying that it's been spun up uh, 100%. And if there is an error, then they're going to have to go back and fix the error and show you that they they that they can pull your data. So it's really it's a good exercise to do every quarter with them. Uh, data encryption, we see this all the time too. You have all these protections in place, but unfortunately you get hacked and they get their get your data. Encryption, you want to be able to hide the data that they can't unencrypt it. They can't decrypt the data. Um, People don't even realize that they're buying, they're paying for these big subscriptions to Microsoft 365 and Office 365, and they have BitLocker. BitLocker, all you have to do is turn it on. You put it on your files, you can put it on your servers, and it'll encrypt your data. And it's really, it's a good, really good failsafe, uh, failsafe for anybody to have. So it's really enforce that encryption wherever you can. Uh, on phones, on, uh, like I said, on servers, on files. Um, you want to also make sure that that data is not being saved on your desktop because if you're saving it on your desktop, you can't then encrypt it. It has to be in a particular file location where it can, BitLocker can be enabled. So you have to let your clients know, don't take all your sensitive files and put it on your desktop. Put it in a file folder, just turn on your data encryption with BitLocker. It doesn't impact the way they work. It's really just a back end method of if there, anything gets stolen, they, no one outside the organization who doesn't have the keys for that can't get access to that data. Um, somebody was again, asking, no additional uh, cost. Joe, somebody was asking about uh, whether they need to worry about uh, Microsoft OneDrive. Um, you know, you know, you mean the sharing of data between between people? Is that is that what the question is about? It just said, "What do we, do we need to worry about Microsoft OneDrive?" I would assume there's just the the one drive that you could keep all your files on. It's like a cloud service. Yeah, 
Yeah. So again, OneDrive is also uh, can be encrypted. So if you put turn on the encryption on every every service that's in Microsoft, uh, the OneDrive as well. It's just again that desktop on your laptop or your computer that is not part of the Microsoft ecosystem that is going to not be able to be encrypted. So that's where you want to make sure that everything stays in your ecosystem. Uh, and this is where policies are really important to have to make sure people understand that, hey, these are the places we're putting encryption. And this is where you need to save your data to protect that information. Okay, that, hopefully that, that clears that up. All right. Uh, also, hardware and data destruction. Um, another thing we're seeing is that Number one, people don't know where all their hardware is, whether it be laptops, servers, whatever in, in house. Uh, and um, when they go to get rid of their old machines, they're not wiping them correctly. You know, they're not doing the data wiping. They're giving it to a recycling company. Let me tell you something. We've seen many instances where recycling companies are not the most ethical either. They're taking the machines, they're taking the information off the machines and they're selling that information. They're not giving any kind of, uh, they're not destroying the data properly even. Um, they're not giving a certificate of destruction, which you should have so that you know that it's being destroyed properly, the data. Uh, and we also remember that there's co the copiers and printers that we lease or we buy has data on the memory. And that's where people, when I tell them about that, their eyes kind of light up like, oh my God, so many things that not just that you do for clients, but you might be making copies of your social security card or your driver's license. That data that you copy is staying in the hard drive of those machines. You have to make sure that those hard drives are also being wiped and being wiped properly. You please use a reputable data destruction company uh, that provides those data, uh, those certificates of destruction and are not just, uh, I, and this, this boggles my mind to this day of how so many old school train of thought, people think that they just drill a hole or they shred a hard drive, um, physically shred it, that the data is gone. That is not the case. Uh, we even have one person who said, oh, I throw it in the lake. You can still pull out those tapes. Any little piece of tape has terabytes of data that can be pulled off of it. So drilling a hole does nothing. Shredding it does nothing. Throwing in a lake does nothing. Please make sure that it is properly wiped before being destroying that hard drive. Multi-factor authentication. Uh, I know for a lot of people, it is a pain in the neck and they don't wanna do it. But, and we talked about Okta earlier, but it's not the norm. Uh, normally it is in conjunction with strong passwords. Multi-factor authentication is a great way to protect your information, uh, to your access to your, your your devices and to your applications. Um, you know, for those few seconds it takes just to get into your application is worth the security. You know, anybody can steal a password these days. And I'm gonna get to a slide that shows how fast it takes to crack a password. And everybody's gonna be like, oh my God, those are my passwords. <laughs> and how, oh my God, I need to change that right away. Um, you know, you could do the, the multi-factor either whether it be a text message or through an email or through a call or through your authenticators, it really doesn't matter. Uh, but what I would suggest is definitely implementing some form of MFA that is really, that can be used anywhere. Um, it really is the best way right now. And, and on top of everything else, the insurance companies are all requiring multi-factor authentication for cyber insurance. And I'm going to go off topic for a second because cyber insurance for everybody, it's not the end all be all. And I give this lecture all the time and I don't mean it to be a lecture, but we've gotten to a point in society that we've, de we've decided that the cyber insurance companies are the ones that drive the protection of data and information. When in reality, cyber insurance only kicks in after a breach happens. So we need to get more in the mindset of being proactive and protecting and detecting rather than saying, oh, I have cyber insurance, I'm covered. All cyber insurance will do is give you some financial restitution if you have to pay for these services to restore your data. And at that point, your reputational, uh, your reputation has already been, hey, you've been hacked. Like, you know, so that's, you don't let that you let your clients think that cyber insurance is your protection. It is not a protection it is only part of the programs if you if they need financial restitution. 
Uh, mobile devices, please make sure that you have in within your companies or their company mobile device management tool. Because if anybody loses their phone or if they get terminated, you want to be able to wipe out all that information that they have on you or your clients in remotely. You can't rely on them to, to be able to, to do it on their own. You want to be able to, any kind of stolen device, you want to remotely wipe that, wipe that device. Also use strong authentication. I always re recommend the, uh, the biometric. Also for anybody who still has a four digit login on their phone, please change that to six. Four is so easy and quick to, um, to crack. Uh, not that six is a whole lot more, but it's a lot harder. So please change it to six immediately. I know it's it's easier for people to remember four, but six is really much stronger. Uh, when you see an update to your phones, update them immediately because they're there for security reasons. They're not there for, uh, to, for just emojis. So you have to instill that on your clients as well. Hey, you, or you have an iPhone or you have an Android. If you're an iPhone and you're still on version 15, you have all, and you have all your emails and all your client data on your phone, you're susceptible to a lot of vulnerabilities. So please make sure you're updating your operating systems and your apps when they ask for those updates. Uh, screen timeouts. I can't tell you, I tell this all the time. People go to Starbucks or they go to Dunkin' and they, they sit down and they're going to stay there and they're staying with their friends. They go up, they pick up their order, they leave their phone on their um, on wherever they're sitting and then they meet a friend and they start talking and their phone's still on. Someone walks away with their phone and their phone is still open and on there's their credit card information, their client information, everything, because everybody has apps for everything today. Please set a timeout, whether it be a minute or whatever the case might be, so that at least if you're watching your phone, but get into the habit of just locking your phone if you walk away from it. But at least this way, it's it locks out your phone immediately. Um I say turn off Bluetooth when not in use. I know really honestly what I mean is we all link our Bluetooth to our watches and other devices that we use, like our AirPods or Air, Air phone, uh, headphones. But just make sure once in a while that you're not connecting your Bluetooth or if someone is connecting to your Bluetooth from a device that should not be connecting to your phone. It's very easy to connect to Bluetooth on someone's phone or you to connect to a device without really knowing because it's really in that settings section and you really don't pay attention to it and there's never usually a, a notification popping up sometimes saying hey you've connected to this device or do you want to connect to this device so just be aware of when your bluetooth connects to something else uh and avoid using the public wi-fi's everybody here has great cellular plans now where it's usually unlimited data but the problem with the wi-fi networks if you don't have to use them is that a lot of times what hackers will do will set up a second network. If you're in Starbucks and it's a, the network is supposed to be just Starbucks Wi-Fi, they will set up a Starbucks one and you will think that you were jumping on the Starbucks network and they will jump into your phone from their Wi-Fi. So just be aware of what's going on if you really, really need to attach to a Wi-Fi network, a public network. All right, this is the slide I was talking about with passwords. This is the latest slide the latest chart of how long it takes to brute force a password in 2023. And this is the one that everybody's like, whoa, um, look at the purple and red sections, how quickly it takes for someone to get your password, to crack your password. If you have a non-complex password, if you don't have a, right now, I think the, the rule of thumb is to have 14 characters, including complexity. And everyone's like, well, I can't remember 14 user passwords for all my stuff. How am I going to do this? Well, what I recommend, and I'm going to go to the right side of this chart right now and say, get a password manager. For anybody who doesn't know what a password manager is, it's really, you remember one password, complex password. It will open up all your other passwords for you. You can save hundreds and hundreds of passwords on there. I have different passwords for everything. I couldn't remember them. I use Keeper myself. It's a wonderfully encrypted um, the, the application. You can put it on your web browser so it, it'll automatically populate. You could set it that it automatically populates but not automatically logs in or whatever you want to do or if you just want to open it up to get your passwords from it. Uh, you could also put it on your phone so you could open up on your passwords, uh, all your passwords on your phone. 
So I highly recommend that. But one complex password on that. Don't fall in the purple and red sections. Nobody wants to have their password cracked instantly or even in six hours. I mean, that's just that's just crazy these days. So try to be in the orange, yellow, and green sections. Um, you know, with the more complex passwords, we, we don't always recommend anymore that you do password changes as often as they used to do in the past. Um, what I would like to do, what I like to usually recommend is if you're going to do password changes, if, if you have a complex and you have it in that orange, yellow, and green area, maybe every quarter, maybe twice a year, um, that would be fine because you have the length and complexity and you're falling in the areas where that's happening and you have MFA in place. So if you have these levels, you won't have to always be like, oh, they're making me change my password again. So it's something to think about with your clients, you know, just put something very complex in place, use a password manager and don't use the same password for numerous accounts. This is where people, they'll use the same password for bank account, credit card, every, every bank account, you get them one, you're getting them all. So please try to have different passwords for all these different things and put them in your password manager. And, hey, Joe, uh, we have another question here. Sure. If I could ask you quick. Um, sure. Is there any risk of the password managers getting hacked? There have been some that have been hacked and that's why I don't put them on. Well, that's why I recommend Keeper. There have been one, uh, I forgot which one it was, but uh, it's escaping my mind. Now. There has, there was one that was hacked a year ago, but it's it's a rare occurrence. Uh, Keeper is one that I've used for probably about almost 10 years. No, not 10 years, five or six years now. They're highly encrypted. They're highly secure. I do recommend them. NordPass, I think, is also fine. Um, RoboForm should be fine. Uh, but I, I personally recommend Keeper. Um, and, you know, they're, they're also constantly updating their security. I know I just had a, uh, another update recently, so they are staying on top of things. And that's the kind of company you want to go, go with. Look, nothing is 100% secure. And I think we need to, to remember that. No matter what anybody puts in place in anything, nothing is 100% secure. But if you do your research on these different vendors when you go use them and realize, hey, um, and we'll talk about vendor management in a minute, that they're putting security patches in place on their applications. They're doing SOC 2 reports on a regular basis. They are also have policies related to the different things. You know they're being proactive, so you could have a little bit more um, a warm and fuzzy feeling, so to speak, that they're going to take do their due diligence to protect you. And that's what I really like about using Keeper. So uh, do your homework and look at the different ones. Um, you'll see that they have not had a breach in the last five years that I've used them. So I, I highly recommend them. Um, also, one of the big things we see is don't re write down your password and leave it in plain sight. Uh, that means under keyboards, under under uh, mouse pads. Uh, we see that a lot with the small companies and in education. So it's, um, you know, you don't know who's walking through your business. You know, how many times do you have contractors walking through or the uh, the cleaning people? I mean, why why take that risk? So just just be careful with that. Uh, this is again a good a good chart to have and to, and to keep a hold of. Um, embrace education and training. I know it's a pain, and I know people they what they'll do is they'll get the videos and just click and click and click and click, and they don't really watch anything. The live ones thrown in there once in a while is great. Um, you know, humans are one of the biggest risks to any organization. People love to throw money technology. They will buy the best antivirus. They will buy the best scanning tools or everything. But it takes one human, one person to click on a link to take down the whole company. So awareness and training is a must as, as much as it is a pain uh, to some people or they think it's a pain. The phishing tests along with this are important because you really want to, again, not to single out those people who are problematic, but to understand as an organization where your problem areas are and to them maybe without, without embarrassing anybody, putting the right training in place. To have the same training every single year on the same topics gets repetitive and then you're not uh, really training or teaching about the latest risks and threats to cyber and cybersecurity and information security. So, 
really embrace it. I mean, I try to make these as informative as possible. Every training I do, I try to customize for every single organization or every single company that I'm doing it for that would be relevant for them. And then the question and answer. I love the question and answer because you don't get that in the videos. And a lot of people I'm sure walk away from some of those videos if they're watching them with questions, but who do you ask? You just don't know sometimes. Uh, your IT companies, your MSPs or your IT department, they're not security professionals per se. They're really, uh, I'm not gonna say just, but they're IT professionals to make sure that you are operating and you can do your job on a daily basis. They're not security professionals knowing all those answers. So it's good to have live trainings like this to ask those questions. We are the first line of defense. Uh, physical security, make sure you're shutting down your computer when you leave it. Windows L is very easy because, again, you get up for a cup of coffee for two seconds. Someone, a contractor walks by, sees what's on your screen. That's personal health information, personal information on someone or very sensitive information on a client. And God knows you don't know what their uh, intentions are. It's dangerous. Tailgating. Um, we talk about this with a lot of companies, especially some of the bigger companies. Hey, you don't know if that person who forgot their ID card that day was terminated yesterday. Maybe they didn't tell you through an email through the company. And they're trying to get into your organization without the best intentions. So, you know, don't let them make them get their ID card or go through security. Keep a clean desk. Um, the amount of information that's left in paper on desks is just unbelievable. Um, you know, lock things up at the end of the day. If you know something is sensitive, don't say, oh, I'll take care of it in the morning. Lock it up anyways. You know, it, there's no reason to leave it out. Uh, again, you don't know who's coming into your offices at night. You have cleaning crews. You have other people. Don't do that. It's, you know, please. Uh, and physical walkthroughs of your location. Even if you have a small office or if you have multiple locations, walk through and see, does my alarm system work on this door? Do I have the right fire suppression? Do I have video cameras facing all the right spots? Do a physical walkthrough at least once a year. Uh, we give out checklists to clients and say, do it four times a year and do it with multiple people. Do it with your owners, your facilities, your administrators, um, your security team, your IT team. So because everybody sees it from a different lens and a different perspective. So you need to get that different perspective. If you have your physical walkthroughs just done by your facilities or your security alone. All they're going to worry about is cameras and maybe fire extinguishers. And I'm not trying to, to downplay that, but they may just think of that thing. But if you have your IT people there, you're like, oh, you know what? Access to my server room is not being protected. You need to now, and if you have someone from administration, oh, you know what? The security of my people, the physical security of my people are not being protected here. Please, we need to address this. So it needs to be a team effort. Uh, computer safety, never download software that's not approved or, or vetted through your IT department. I can't tell you how many times people download malicious software that has not been vetted. And if the IT department doesn't know about it, they can't protect it. And the next thing you know, like what happened? Oh, by the way, blah, blah, blah. Uh, update your operating system and software and computers when, when prompted and then restart when needed. Again, it's there for security patches. You need to get those security patches with everything going on today in the world, people are constantly poking holes at your applications and your systems. So the companies are doing their best to stay up to date with the security patches. And that's why it constantly is happening. Uh, don't plug in unknown USB flash drives. You can tell your clients, you, a lot of times I see this, it happens. It's still happening today where they'll leave flash drives in a parking lot and the flash drive might say something cool like lottery winnings or bank account and someone will bring it into their office like oh i wonder what that is plug it in they're plugging in a virus so bring that to your it department the last one uh, on there is attack feed the reason i put that in there it's really it's it's a uh running stories of all vulnerabilities that are happening in the world there's tabs in there for those who are very technically technologically advanced and those who are like myself who want to just know about the governance stuff the privacy stuff uh, and things in our field. So check it out, you know, look for it, see what's going on in the world as far as threats to healthcare, to all these different industries. Um, I know we're running out of time, but I'm gonna go quickly. Uh, if you, uh, you feel you are the victim of this, disconnect from the network, don't turn off the computer. If you turn off the computer, you're going to mess with any investigation. Um, they will not be able to find out where the hack came from, how to stop it and how to clean it. 
So tell your clients, do not turn it off. Uh, just unplug it from the network and turn off the Wi-Fi so that you're not connecting out to anything else. Uh, and then don't use the device and contact the IT department immediately. We just came across an instance where someone got hacked on their device for at home on a Saturday and forgot to tell their organization until the following Thursday. So who knows if that person got into their systems throughout in well, how many days when they got back on Monday, Monday, two, four days, they could have been in their system before IT even knew to do anything about it. Uh, if you're a victim of breach call, like I said, don't email, call your IT department because what could happen is they could be taking over your emails and that email could be going and you sending sensitive information to the hacker. Call your IT department. Uh, they'll walk you through all the steps necessary. Uh, and personal data, change your passwords, check your accounts constantly for unauthorized activity. Uh, what, and this goes for businesses too. You know, notify your bank and credit card companies. Uh, invest in a good monitoring service. I use ID Watchdog. ID Watchdog is phenomenal in my eyes. Uh, they not only do your financial data, they they check the dark web and they also do sex offenders for anybody who has kids. Um, you know, they'll check to see your surrounding areas and you could actually do, I have a daughter in college. I put in her address too. So they tell me about sex offenders in her area. Um, if you have any money stolen from you in your from your business or your bank accounts within 72 hours, contact that ic3.gov and they within 72 hours they could potentially get your money back so it's a good resource to have it's the fbi themselves tell your friends and family you're hacked because a lot of people have their their accounts linked with their family and you never know if they're going to get also hacked based on the based on the account that was hacked on your end uh continue to monitor financial and credit card accounts even after you change everything to make sure that you were completely cleaned out at that point. Make sure you're, comp you're constantly scanning your computer for viruses and malware. Get a good antivirus. For those of you, I put Bitdefender on there. That's a personal one. Uh, at work, you know, use Sentinel, use a, a CrowdStrike, use something good. If you're at home, please don't use the ones that come with the computer like McAfee or Norton. They are not that good and they put a lot of adware on your computers. I personally use Bitdefender. I love it. It's very, it protects very well. Uh, and also notify your IT department if you are hacked at home, because God knows if you bring in your device and you attach to your network that you're now bringing in something that they are not aware of. So these are tips that can be used across either personal or through work or through any client of any size of any organization that I think we all need to know and, and really could help us um, protect and detect ourselves, uh, detect anything that from happening before it happens. So thank you. I, I, I appreciate your time. I'll take any questions. See if there's any questions out there. Uh, next time we do this, we'll set this up where it's more of a meeting thing instead of a webinar so that everybody can pop on and people can ask questions and everything else. But thanks, Joe. I think you gave us a lot to think about. That was awesome. I know I learned a lot and hopefully everybody else did too. Uh, for everybody who's not here in the room with us, I just wanna let everybody know if they didn't already know this, that uh, this is a New York State Society of CPA meeting. Uh, it's the uh, Suffolk Chapters Nonprofit Committee. Um, we try to come together five to six times a year to provide training, discuss issues that um, practitioners are having within their practices, or uh, if you are a nonprofit organization, some issues you're having within your organization. If you'd like to become a member of the uh, Suffolk Chapters Nonprofit Committee, um, please just reach out to Kelly. Her email is kaserini at serinicpa.com. Let her know that you want to become a member of the uh, State Society's nonprofit, Suffolk Chapter Nonprofit Committee. We'll add you onto the list so that you get information about uh, upcoming meetings. Uh, our next meeting is going to be happening in January. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about some of the uh, trends that are happening in the nonprofit sector and um, really what those trends or how those trends impact the audit process um, and how they um, manifest themselves with respect to risk. Um, so those are things that we'll be talking about at the next meeting. Um, we will be sending around copies of Joe's slides to everybody who um, signed up and attended today. Um, so everybody will get them. As James mentioned at the very beginning of the presentation, 
Um, you also will be getting a, uh, a questionnaire. Um, please fill that out. If you don't fill it out, you will not get the one hour of CPE credit for today. So if you're looking for that one hour of CPE credit, um, please fill it out. Uh, I don't know if anybody has any questions for Joe or if anybody has any general questions regarding um, things that are happening within their practice or their practice or happening within their organizations that they want to um, discuss or talk about or, or ask about. Um, you can either throw it in the chat or the Q&A. We'll stay live for a few more minutes just to see if anybody has any questions. I don't know if anybody here in the room has any questions they want to go over, anything they want to ask Joe or... And Ken, let me just say that if anybody uh, after this, if they come up with any questions when they're at a client or something, feel free to email me uh, to ask those questions. I, I'm definitely open to helping. Yeah, we appreciate it. I mean, one of the things that you talk about a bunch of things, but there are several things we have a, uh, we're in the process of putting together a risk committee for our um, firm. And uh, I already have uh, half a dozen things to uh, include in our risk committee to kind of go over and focus in on as part of that risk committee. And for those nonprofits um, who are part of this, uh, that's something we definitely do encourage. We do encourage nonprofits to establish a risk committee. And I think um, anybody who's um, part of that risk committee should be watching today's presentation that Joe did. Uh, and it's actually something you probably should share with some of your staff so that they uh, understand some of this. So I think it's it's super important to uh, kind of factor in a lot of this. There was a lot of really, really good information that uh, that came up. Uh, That's somebody asked if uh, we can provide some information about becoming a member of the organization you just mentioned. Um, well, the New York State Society of CPAs is a... Um, State Society for All CPAs, as it, as it says. Um, we happen to be um, out here in Suffolk County, and uh, there's the Suffolk chapter of the New York State Society. And we have, uh, we're one of the few chapters that actually has a nonprofit committee. The state has a statewide nonprofit committee, which is kind of more formalized. Uh, the cha Suffolk chapter is a little less formal. And as I said, if you want to kind of join the Suffolk chapter and be part of things, um, Kelly just popped up her email address in the chat. So if you just send Kelly an email and let her know that you want to be part of the Suffolk chapter, like I said, we, we try to do five or six of these types of trainings um, every year. Um, and we're also looking for uh, ideas for future topics and everything else. So it really is uh, a good, if you're a nonprofit organization and you know you want to Kind of keep abreast of what's happening in the industry from a accounting perspective and, and also you know we deal with things like as as this meeting shows risk management and some of the other risks that we're looking at and we try to look at it from a practitioner perspective but i think it has a lot of real benefit for the nonprofit sector also and uh, i should have probably mentioned that uh, james who's just wave james James and Kelly, who's over here on this side, are the co-chairs of the committee. I just happen to have a louder mouth. Okay. Does anybody else have any other questions or comments before we, we break? And like I said, uh, next meeting, we will do it in a meeting format so that everybody can kind of jump in and we can have active conversation after the presentation or before the presentation or during the presentation. I, I don't see anything else. so. Thanks everybody for uh, participating and uh, we'll see you in January. We'll get the dates out in uh, for the January meeting. So thank you everyone. And thanks Joe, that was awesome. Thank you, thanks for having me. Everybody have a thank great you. weekend. You, you too. too. All right, bye. Bye.